you you it's now easier for you to get knocked out you mm. don't get tougher this isn't like putting a rock on yeah. you put a rock on and you you hump that rock for time you're going to get more resilient and feel better and get stronger with the rock it doesn't work like that with your brain you don't get used to you don't get conditioned to getting punched in the head it only gets worse you only can take so many hits over time and also people are different you know some people they're they're just hard headed and they'll they'll be okay and some people they just have a little bit of a of a weakness where over time it really impacts them in a negative way and you could see that the the examples i always think of is george foreman versus muhammad ali i mean yeah. george foreman foreman certainly took massive head trauma during his career and he still was relative you know he's relatively good to go and you know we all saw the deterioration of muhammad ali you know towards the end of his life and so those are two people that were both heavyweight fighters they both took a lot of damage and one of them the damage had less impact yeah in, uh, over time so just like you know just like some people will have you know spine problems and some people will have you know skin problems and some people will have you know heart problems like two people that are both marathoners one of them can have serious heart issues and the other one can be perfectly fine and and it has they're both training they're both training hard but there's just that genetic component that you have to account for yeah and those tbis nowadays that are so scary too just with the brain not healing having those later in life effects not only the the mental cognitive function but the the depression the suicidal thoughts that stuff's that stuff catches people off guard all the time yeah it's it's very disturbing and the the type of you know when i was in the military you're getting exposed to that stuff even in even in the 90s when there's no war going on uh, you know we're setting off charges we've got breaches going off we're th throwing uh, crashes into rooms and being in those rooms getting crashed all those things those are all i mean just going out and shooting uh, a Carl Gustav. Mm. You know, nowadays, they limit exposure to firing a Carl Gustav. I don't know what the exact number is, but oh, you can't be around more than three a day or something. I, I don't know what the numbers are. Yeah. When I was a young SEAL and I was the range safety officer and the other guys that were range safety officers, we'd go out there and, and eat 30 of those Carl G rockets <sighs> in a day or law rockets or you know, you know whatever you know AT4s whatever the weapon was we'd go out there and just RSO and you're getting your bell rung every time and you just that's your job and you do it so they're they're definitely being more proactive in keeping guys exposures uh, mit mitigated as much as they can yeah yeah it is i mean that the more we learn the better we get which is awesome you even see that just on the human performance side the human performance uh, the innovation like of those fighters was definitely something that caught my eye too where and you see it in the nfl you see it everywhere athletes now versus 20 years ago all these innovations stacking on top of each other i mean the the human performance levels that we're at today are incredible and it still kind of feels like we're kind of just scratching the surface on a few things no, yeah no doubt about it the the knowledge and information that we have now compared to what we had 10 years, 20 years, 30 years ago, it's radically different and yes, radically improved. So like someone like Gaethje and in, in Holloway at that level, are they, are they training multiple times a day, like a two hour session in the morning, two hours, midday, two hours afternoon is, is their full time life training for that fight? Oh yeah, definitely. But one, one thing that's interesting is, Max Holloway doesn't spar anymore. Hmm. So he's one of these, and there's a whole camp and it's pretty, pretty prevalent now of people that are, they're not sparring because they recognize that even all those light punches that you take sparring, they add up over time. And so they, and when I, I don't say they don't spar at all, but they very, very much minimize the amount of sparring that they do. And they focus on their timing and their technique as opposed to, actually sparring all the time so then you get someone like sean strickland and sean strickland he spars you know five six days a week and that's just how he lives his life so there's def there's definitely different camps there and but i would say one of the biggest evolutions is p some fighters sparring less 
a lot less than what we mm. used to. You know, when I trained fighters back in the day, we would spar. We would just spar. We would, And we would spar sometimes with just MMA gloves. We wouldn't even use boxing gloves. We would just spar like an MMA fight, like five rounds. We're going to spar. We're going to fight. You know, you've got to fight in four weeks. Cool. We're going to spar five rounds today. You against me. And that's what we would do. And we did that a lot. And look, do you take a little bit of off off of your, your striking? Sure, of course you do. But you're still like getting occasionally people getting knocked out you're yeah. definitely getting your bell rung you're definitely getting sat down sometimes where you, you know, <laughs> you're gonna have a headache so i think right now one of the most interesting advancements in training for mma is is actually less sparring and that's been pretty prevalent but then again like i said there's guys like strong sean strickland who's out there all the time just he spars five six days a week just depends yeah it depends on the athlete and your martial arts trajectory in life started a little bit later, like in, in your twenties. I, yeah. I know that you, you kind of went in and rolled with, with Dean Lister and, and kind of got hooked since then. Well, yeah, I was actually a, a seal master chief. I was on my first deployment and the seal master chief was the equivalent of, of a white belt in jujitsu. He was very, he had very limited skills for 1992, 1993, but in 1992, 1993, if you knew any jujitsu, you were just going to dominate. And so this old master chief and great guy, I mean, I still know him, but this old master chief, he brought four or five of us into the, into the judo training facility on this Navy base and just rolled us up choked us out, tapped us out. And that was my introduction to, oh, there's, there's a there's a superpower. There's a magic power because there's no way that I, here I was 21 years old and, you know, fresh out of seal training, 200 pounds, you know, I, I should be able to destroy this 40 year old, old man, <laughs> yeah. uh, master chief. And he just, you know, and it's same, you know, all the guys, he just, just tore through us. It was no factor. And that's because jujitsu is a technique that if you don't understand that technique, you're just going to get, you're just going to get annihilated. So that happened. I trained for a while there and I kind of got the basics of jujitsu down, which again, in the early nineties, this is, this is pre UFC. Yeah. So if you jujitsu, you were just going to win. Like you were going to win any interaction that you got in because the other person literally did not know what to do. And so I was like that for a few more years. And then, yeah, I, my, my friend who was actually originally part of that group, another seal, a guy named Jeff Higgs, when we had got back off that deployment, he sought out and found jujitsu and started training all the time. And so fast forward like a year and a half, two years, he comes over to my house and he gets, says, hey, you want to train? And I said, sure. And again, I was a lot bigger and stronger than he was. And we went out across the street into the park on the grass and he just tapped me out a bunch of times. I said, what are you doing? Yeah. And he said, I'm doing jujitsu every day. And I said, where? He gave me the address. I was there the next day. And yeah, that's when I met Dean Lister. And that's where I, that's when I really got obsessed with training jujitsu. I did it, did it every single day, a couple times a day. And I did it for until, until right now.